Today, I'd like to talk about rotation. Specifically, how to interpolate one rotation into another. In many games and physics engines, we need a way to describe the rotation of an object in space and then manipulate it. Often, an object is oriented a certain way, but we'd like it to face another way. So we should rotate the object from the current rotation to the new rotation. But how do we do this? If we knew how, not only could we rotate our object as we please, but we could also apply an angular force to it and carry out its momentum as it slowly rotates. The first thing we'll need is a way to describe a rotation mathematically, and math has no short supply of ways to do this. Once we know how to describe the rotation, we'll need to know how to manipulate those rotations in order to interpolate one into another. We will also need to know how to describe an object's angular velocity for simulations. When we figure all that out, we'll be able to interpolate rotation. But before we get into rotation, let's first talk about interpolation, moving one point to another. So we have a point A and a point B. We want to move a point from A to B based on a value t from 0 to 1. If t is 0, our point will be on A, and if t is 1, our point will be on B, and everywhere in between. To do this, we start with the difference between A and B, that is the vector pointing from A to B. We then scale this vector using t. Finally, we add the vector to A to bring it into position, and voila, we have a linear interpolation. The premise behind this is really simple, almost too simple for a math video if you ask me. But don't worry, this will come in handy when we get to rotation, because these three simple steps of taking the difference, scaling, and then adding are more complex in the case of rotation, so having them laid out so plainly will help us to understand how to do it later. Now of course, there are far more ways to interpolate things than just linear, which we will cover later in the video. But these three basic steps help us to use several forms of interpolation for rotation. Without further ado, let's talk about rotation. There are several ways to describe the rotation of an object, Euler angles, a matrix, quaternions, but for today's video, we will be using rotors. I'll take you through the steps for how to derive rotors and how they are used. But if you already know how to use rotors, feel free to skip to this timestamp. Now our quest begins with reflection, mirroring a vector over another one. See, as it turns out, if you reflect a vector twice in this way around different vectors A and then B, the resulting vector will have rotated by twice the angle between A and B. This fact will be very useful to us when we're building our rotors. Let's start by deriving the formula for reflecting a vector over another one. We'll have a vector V, which we want to reflect, and a vector A, which we will be reflecting around. Let's assume that A is a unit vector to make the math easier. To reflect it, we want to keep the part of V which is parallel to A the same, but we want to negate the part which is perpendicular. By taking the dot product between A and V, and then scaling A by that, we project V onto A. This is the parallel part of V. To get the perpendicular part, all we have to do is subtract the parallel part off of V. Now we just subtract the perpendicular part off of the parallel part to reflect V. This simplifies to this formula. Now we just do this twice, and we've rotated our point. This here is called a transformation. We are able to perform as many transformations on our point as we'd like. In fact, a transformation is how we will store the orientation of an object. 
What this does is encode the transformation needed to get from the identity to whatever orientation the object is in. An important part of transformations, however, is having the ability to stack them, essentially transforming a transformation, rotating it from where it is now. The problem we run into is that reflecting around vectors doesn't make that very easy. Only way we can really stack a transformation is just by remembering all the steps that it took to get here. After a while, we might have millions of little vectors lying around a clog in our memory. To fix that, we want to compress down these vectors into a single object that itself encodes the transformation and which can be modified by other transformations. Enter bivectors. A bivector is what you get when you take the wedge product of two vectors. It describes not a direction, but the area inscribed by the vectors. Let's take the wedge product of our two vectors and see what we get. We start by substituting the vectors for the component form. Then we distribute the terms. From here, there are two things that we can simplify. First, some of the basis vectors are being wedged with themselves. Thing is, if you try to describe the area between a vector and itself, there's actually no area at all. So wedging something with itself cancels out to zero. Next, we see that we have both x wedge y and y wedge x as separate terms. Ideally, we would have these combined together into a single term. As a consequence of our previous statement, if we wedge the sum of two vectors with itself, we see that it requires the wedge product to be anti-symmetric. If we switch the vectors around, we get a minus sign. This makes sense with the area as well, since if we switch the vectors around, it is said that we negate the area. So we can switch around the y and the x, and add the terms. What we're left with is a clean formula expressing the wedge product for two-dimensional vectors. The bivector there, x wedge y, is what we call a basis bivector. It's similar to the basis vectors x and y, but for bivectors. But before we can apply this to our reflection vectors, we need one last thing. The geometric product. This is when you just straight multiply two vectors together. But what exactly does this mean to multiply two vectors together? For the wedge product, we thought of the area. For the dot product, we thought of their parallelity. For this, let's try something a little different. We can expand out the expression by adding it to itself and cutting it in half to maintain equivalency. Further, we can do the same thing with a new term, where we add half of it and subtract half of it. We can rearrange it so that we have two terms, each having an AB and a BA. This puts us in a nice position, since we have one term which is symmetric and another term which is anti-symmetric. It is useful to define the symmetric part as the dot product, and the anti-symmetric part as the wedge product, as each of these products share these properties of symmetry. And so we're left with a nice and clean expression. The geometric product of two vectors is the sum of their dot product and their wedge product. Now let's get back to the reflection formula. What would happen if we replace the dot product here with its version from the geometric product. Let's find out. We first substitute in the definition. Then those coefficients cancel. Then we distribute in the a. Then we notice we have a vector multiplying by itself, a squared. Since the geometric product is the sum of the dot product and the wedge product, the wedge product part cancels to zero. So all that's left is the dot product. Since a is a unit vector, the dot product between it and itself is just 1, so that cancels down. Then those v terms cancel, and we're left with a very clean expression. To apply our second reflection around a b, we just sandwich it with a pair of b's. Because the geometric product is associative, we can multiply a and b together first. And that there, a and b multiplied together, is our transformation, the rotor. On the left, we multiply in the direct rotor, and on the right, we multiply in the inverse rotor. Let's expand it out and see what we get.
The direct rotor and the inverse rotor have common terms in them, so we can substitute the terms with new variables denoting the parameters of the rotor. The inverse rotor is like the direct rotor, except the bivector part is negative. As a side note, taking the geometric product between two different basis vectors is the same as taking their wedge product, so xy is the same as x wedge y here. As another side note, the rotor was created with two unit vectors, and that property carries over into the rotor itself. So if you square all the terms and add them up, you will get exactly one. Now that we have a rotor defined, let's use it to transform our vector. We'll start by deriving the formula for the full transformation by bringing in the rotor and its inverse into the double reflection formula. What a nice formula. As you can see, applying the formula to our point rotates it in the same way that the vector reflection did before. Further, we can draw a unit square on the screen to show the transformation of the rotor. Now let's see about stacking a rotor transformation, that is, rotating a rotation. We'll have a rotor A applied first, and then a rotor B applied second. Now this is a beautiful formula. The best part is that multiplying two rotors together returns another rotor, which means that we can stack transformations effortlessly. All we have to do is store the rotation of our object as a rotor, and we can use more rotors to manipulate that rotation. Using the unit squares, we can see how the transformation stacks, where it does one and then the other, essentially adding them together. So far, we've been using rotors in two dimensions. However, nothing is stopping us from going to the next dimension. In fact, rotors are able to go to any number of dimensions. Let's first derive the 3D rotor definition by multiplying two 3D vectors together. Like last time, the direct and the inverse rotors share terms which can be extracted out into their own variables and the inverse is like the direct, except that the bivector parts are negative. This time, however, we have three bivectors instead of just one, one for every pair of basis vectors. This is consistent with the fact that in 3D rotation, you have three degrees of freedom. Now that we have 3D rotors defined, let's apply it to a vector transformation. Let's apply this to a unit cube to visualize the transformation. Beautiful. And now to rotor stacking. Again, we use the unit cubes to visualize the transformations and then their additions. Rotor stacking in three dimensions has much more going on than in two dimensions. For starters, the transformations are no longer commutative. Now the order matters. And further, the rotations can be anywhere now not bound to any particular plane, but in all the infinitely many possible planes. Now the formulas this time around are substantially larger, however there are plenty of symmetries buried inside. Interestingly, these formulas are identical to the ones for quaternions. This is why it is often said that rotors are the generalized version of quaternions. Not only do they work in all dimensions, but they are also far more natural to derive. Now that we know how to use rotors, let's reintroduce the linear interpolation formula and apply it to rotation. To recap, the formula has three steps, taking the difference between the start and end, scaling that difference, and then adding the starting position. We know what it means to add rotors, that's just stacking them. So that's one of the three steps down. But what does it mean to take the difference between two rotors? It's actually quite simple. The difference between them will be where one is relative to the other. For instance, if this rotation is A and this rotation is B, this is the rotation needed to get from A to B. To compute it, all we need to do is use the inverse of the one we're subtracting, then we stack them together. Mind you, it's important that we have the inverse one on the right side of the rotor stacking. This is because, algebraically, A and its inverse cancel out, leaving us with B. 
So now we know how to add and subtract rotors, which leaves only scaling. What does it mean to scale a rotor? Suppose we scale it by a factor of 0.5. We want it to take two applications of that rotation to equal the original. Similarly, if we take a third of it, it should take three applications to equal the original. Because rotors stack by multiplication and not addition, this isn't like applying a factor, but more like raising to a power. To raise to the power of a half, we are actually taking the square root, that is, what multiplied by itself equals the original. The problem though is that we don't really know how to do that. Not only do we not know how to take the square root, imagine you need to scale a rotor by some arbitrary factor like 0.6923. To solve this, we need to change our perspective a bit. Remember that rotors rotate the object in some way by a certain angle. The object is rotated by twice the angle between the vectors which made it. What we need to do is find that angle, scale it, and then put it back, creating a new rotor. In the two-dimensional case, all we need is an angle, since all rotations in 2D are locked to the same plane. Fortunately, the angle is encoded in the rotor parameters themselves. All we need to do is take the arctangent of the bivector part over the scalar part and double the angle. The arctangent here essentially converts a vector into an angle. Excellent, now we have the angle of a 2D rotor. But we don't want it to have a value greater than pi or less than minus pi. That way, we guarantee that when we interpolate the rotation, it always takes the shortest path. To make it take the shortest path, we'll clamp it using a modulus operator. We'll add pi, mod it by 2 pi, then subtract pi. Great, now we'll take the shortest path from start to end. Now we can scale the angle as we please and reconstitute the rotor. To reconstitute it, all we do is cut the angle in half, assign the scalar part to the cosine of the angle, and the bivector part to the sine of the angle. This is in effect undoing the arctangent, converting an angle back into a vector. This process of extracting the angle out of a rotor I've come to call linearizing the rotor. This is because in angle form, we are able to scale it, and that translates directly to the rotation as a linear scale of the transformation. Now that we know how to linearize 2D rotors, let's apply the linear interpolation formula to it to interpolate some rotations. We begin by taking the difference between the two rotations. Then we convert the resulting rotor into an angle. Then we scale it and convert it back into a rotor. Finally, we use this rotor as a transformation on the first rotation. And that's it. We've linearly interpolated rotation in two dimensions. By sliding the t value back and forth, we are able to move the rotation between the start and end continuously. Now for the moment you've been waiting for, interpolating 3D rotations. We'll begin by linearizing a 3D rotor. Like last time, the angle is encoded in the rotor itself. Although unlike last time, we can't just plug the values into the arctangent. The arctangent takes one or two values, not four like we have. The key will be to take the absolute value of the bivector part using the Pythagorean theorem. Now we have two values that we can plug into arctangent and get an angle. Like last time, we'll double the angle and clamp it to ensure that it interpolates on the shortest path. Although we run into a bit of a problem. We only have one angle, but that's not enough to tell us how the object is rotating in 3D space. Rotation in 3D has three degrees of freedom, so we need something with three values to encode it, like a vector. Fortunately, we have exactly that with the bivectors. In fact, if you treat the bivector part as a vector, normalize its length using the absolute value from before, and then scale it to be a length equal to the angle in radians, this is exactly what we need. Now the reason why we set the length of the vector equal to the angle is that we can scale the angle by scaling the vector. Interestingly, if you plot this vector in space, where each component maps to the axis perpendicular to the bivector, 
we actually get the axis of rotation, where again, the length of the vector is equal to the angle of rotation around that axis. A healthy reminder, however, is that this quirk is exclusive to 3D, because it is the only dimension where the number of axes and the number of bivectors are the same. Unlike in the two-dimensional case, however, we've gained the ability to fundamentally change the rotation by applying another rotation that isn't quite in the same direction. This will help us when we use more dynamic forms of interpolation, which we'll cover later. Now, in addition to linearizing the rotor, we also need to reconstitute it, which is essentially doing the procedure in reverse. We first take the length of the vector and normalize it, this length will be the angle in radians. Then we cut the angle in half and take the sine and cosine of it. The scalar will be set to the cosine, and the bivector part will be set to the normalized vector times the sine. And thus, we've reconstituted the rotor. Now that we can scale 3D rotors, let's apply it to the interpolation formula. We take the difference, convert it to a vector, scale the vector, convert it back into a rotor, then apply it as a transformation to the first rotation. And there you have it, rotation interpolation in three dimensions. But what if we don't want mere linear interpolation, but something more dynamic? Suppose the destination could move while our object is on the way there. What should we do then to make it get there smoothly? For this, let's use a differential equation which defines the behavior of the object. We'll start with the simple case of a point, and expand to the rotational case. In our equation, we want the position and velocity of the point to have some values, and their evolution through time governed by their derivatives. The velocity says how the position should change, and an additional parameter of acceleration says how velocity should change. So let's define acceleration as the vector going from the point to the destination essentially applying a force to the point, nudging it toward the goal. We'll use a numeric simulation of the equation to move it toward the goal. Essentially, in each tick of the simulation, we'll multiply the derivative by dt, the time step, and add it to the value. We'll do this for both velocity and position. Now that we have it all set up, let's let it run. Hmm, an issue with this setup is that the point drastically overshoots the goal. We'll need the point to slow down. Let's add a dampening term to the equation so that the faster the point is moving, the more it will slow down. Ah, much better. And if we move around the destination, the point will follow. Now that we have dynamic interpolation set up for a point, let's set it up for rotation. The equation is ultimately the same. The acceleration will equal the difference in position minus the velocity times some factor. And applying the derivatives to the values is also ultimately the same. A crucial thing to keep note of, however, is when we scale by the time step dt. If we were to keep the velocity in vector form, it would make it easier to modify and to scale that opposed to converting it to a rotor only to convert it back into a vector again. So what we do is take the difference rotor and convert it into a vector. Then we subtract off the velocity vector times some factor. This is the vector of angular acceleration, or torque. Now that we have acceleration, we multiply it by dt and add it to the velocity. This is how we apply a force to the object. Finally, we multiply the velocity vector by dt and convert it into a rotor. Then we use that rotor to transform the rotor which governs the object's rotation. This is how we apply motion to the object. And just like that, our object is smoothly pursuing the goal, even if it moves. There are many other forms of interpolation which can be used, but these will serve as a good foundation in your own projects and research. Thank you for watching this video. It was made for the Summer of Math Exposition 3, hosted by the one and only 3Blue1Brown. 
I hope you will find the information that I shared useful. If you know anyone else who is passionate about math or computer science, pass this video along to them. Also, all the shaders and Desmos graphs that I used are in the description below. I hope you have a good day, and I'll see you later. Thank <laughs> you.